Before the intro music begins, I would like to express my gratitude to all of the listeners who have subscribed to and listened to Startup Anthology podcast. Startup Anthology aims to celebrate and share the stories and experiences of startup employees and is not meant to reflect any opinion or comment about any particular company. Our goal is to create a community centered around the unique working culture of startup. In this episode of Startup Anthology, the podcast, I'll speak with Paul Austin. Paul is originally from Cleveland Heights, Massachusetts, and holds a Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science from the University of Texas in Austin. Join me on a journey through Paul's 30-year tech career, where we will reflect on his time as a former employee of National Instruments and exploring various aspects of his career, such as developing testing and data acquisition software, partnering with Lego, and creating educational robotic systems. Along the way, we will discover how Paul emphasizes the importance of learning, taking risks, and nurturing a supportive company culture. I hope you enjoy the episode. Well, Jeremy, in a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> when machines had 128K of RAM, yeah. and Star Where? Wars had been out for 10 years. No. And you're trying to figure out how to do something through DOS. <laughs> oh. This is pre-DOS. No DOS. Oh, DOS was there. I had one of the first Mac 128Ks that they sold on the University of Texas campus. They were half price, only $1,200. Wow. And people like might gripe about, I don't know, an expensive Mac now. Yeah, they are expensive now too. But it's just, it's like the price of inflation is not followed. It's like college tuition. Yeah. At that point, you can invest in tools that were rare. I was programming an assembly language on a Mac trying to get millisecond timing on events. And there's no C APIs to do some of this stuff, mm -hmm. a little bit, but you have to learn. In fact, the, the APIs didn't work. They had some bugs in them. So I had to disassemble the code and figure out how to call it in a way that wouldn't cause it to crash. You know, and then four months later, I'm interviewing at a small company in North Austin that's looking for people who program the Macintosh to do real-time sort of data acquisition systems. I had the right experience. So what's your background? How did you get into computers and software and automation? Oh, okay. Or, and and, and yeah. introduce yourself. I'm Paul Austin. I've lived in Austin, Texas here since 1973. I came in in fifth grade. How did I get started? I, my mom took me to the Museum of Science in Boston like once a week. And I got a lot of exposure to there. And she'd take me to weekend seminars. And I'm sure everyone thought she was like, you know, she was just bringing her little kid along while she was going to see the stuff. But no, she was bringing it for me. Are you from Boston area? Cleveland Heights. My dad went to grad school. I uh, went back to get his PhD at Brandeis University. And that's what took us there. And ultimately, he got his PhD. And that's what brought us to University of Texas. So when I moved down to Texas, I lost all my friends. and But I, I brought my technology or whatever. <laughs> so I take things apart. I took apart TVs and radios. And they let me actually fix a TV when I was in sixth grade. I had enough mentoring that I learned how to decharge, discharge the big capacitor. Just with a screwdriver? Safely. That is not where I got my first electric shock. I grew up taking things apart. You know, reflecting back on, on growing up and taking things apart, I look at if a student goes into the University of Texas and they want to do architecture, or maybe they want to do music, like singing, or they're doing instrument, no one shows up on UT's door going, you know, I was thinking my senior year, I'd like to be an architect. No, you have to bring your portfolio you have to bring a skill there. You have to demonstrate what you've done. Okay. In a lot of case, engineering, especially back in the day, I mean, there weren't a ton of opportunities, but people would show up going like, yeah, I was pretty good at math, but I've never done any engineering. What I'm doing now in education is expose students from at least fifth grade on up to pieces of engineering so that it has an intuition to it. So when, when they start to think that something interesting, they know a lot of things that, that fit engineering. I was close by, I just mm. accepted, went down and signed up for the classes I needed the week before. There was no online sign up. You had to go down to what was then the, the drum, mm. the, the old basketball stadium. Okay. And you walked around, you got what your classes you needed. And if you're persuasive enough, you learned how to negotiate almost. I just need, is there any slots? Are you sure? Went in and started double E engineering. And well, that was interesting. I, I liked part of it. And I, I just didn't like the, the self-paced part of it. Okay. I, I like the physics. That was interesting. I love the physics. But then I switched to computer science. I like the computer science stuff. So. What enticed you about computer science and computer engineering, software engineering? Oh, well, I like think it. I like the computer side of whichever right. department. And universities, there, there's vastly different ways of how that's taught and how the departments break down. The University of Texas, the double E department was electrical engineering. I think they actually call it ECE. I think it's electrical and computer engineering, which is really sort of the hardware, microcontrollers. Anyhow, I know I got a Bachelor of Arts in, okay. from the Natural Sciences Department. 
Oh, really? So they kind of came from that world, and this is really fortuitous from National Instruments point of view later on, from simulating and, and modeling things in natural science. So there's areas like, okay, the publishing company, typography, you're yeah. trying to hit deadline, okay. Making that run smoothly is worth a billion dollars of investment. Mm -hmm. So the military, getting that trajectory to get where right. you want so, to, yeah. that's worth a billion dollars. There's a lot of those problem spaces. And you know, I like looking at it from the analytical side. You're always like, so why is the business I'm in here? So the startup I want to talk about is the National Instruments. National Instruments is a core part of Austin. It was a, National Instruments was a little startup started by basically three engineers mm -hmm. um, that worked at Applied Research Labs. And they knew what it was like to put together automated test systems. In their case, they were working in the area of sonar. And they go, hey, you know, there's a thousand other research labs and scientists doing stuff just like we're doing. And they're all finding it just as hard as we are. And what if we make a, what if we make the pieces that make that system work together smoother and easier to put together? And that was really what the the three founders put, pulled together and and started first in their garage, and somewhere in Shoal Creek, and then Technology Boulevard. That's where I worked for just about thirty years. And I, I came in roughly when there were about a hundred people, and retired from that at the end of twenty fifteen. Okay. And it's it's an interesting company. It's sort of easy, perhaps, to know a little bit about it. But to roll back then, what problem were they solving? And so here you had computers. A lot of people are familiar with the IBM PC. There was Macs. If you're on university campuses, Apple Apple had done a really major push, and they were very helpful computers. They were really well adopted by things like the natural science departments. All sorts of departments liked them because they were getting good discounts, and they were excellent for publishing at the time. So if you're doing rich stuff, and that fit well. The challenge with computers back then, it's not really one now, is getting data into them. Okay. You had serial ports for a modem. You could, it was relatively slow. There's a few printers that Centronics printer ports. I'm, I'm kind of data myself. But if you wanted to bring megabytes of data in there, there's two problems. One, there's no port that could bring it in fast. And there wasn't a whole lot of memory to store it in when you got it. Right. Okay. So it was a challenge, but that was their focus. And they were always really on the tip of that on the tip of solving that problem before most people even realized it existed. So what was their solution at that time? So before, in the early days, what you would have is a mini computer, like a uh, PDP-11, that was a thing, or bigger. But PD PDP-11s were close enough to the ground that you could actually like, bring data into them. It wasn't like a mainframe, because a mainframe is like, no, you can't, you bring data in the way it wants to come in. You've right. got disks, it doesn't, didn't have an Ethernet port for that. Okay. But the, the, the computers were almost the level they could. So companies like Hewitt Packard, Tektronix, and some others, they had made, they made the instrumentation that took the analog values and turned them into digital values. Okay. And then they had buses that would bring them into computers and it had its own version of basic. Okay. That's probably not doing it justice. Yeah. But in yeah. the sense of there's only so much features that you could really do with it, that, that that's literally what, what it was. was. Yeah. Right. And so National Instruments solution back then, there's like, hey, this GPIB bus has been made at IEEE spec, will support all the other computers. And their model was, is that you can bring data into your PC now. And so that really hopped on the curve that the PC would keep improving every few years. The speed of the processors, the amount of memory, the hard disk that was available. Right. Moore's law. Moore's law. That was the peak of when that law was really defined. And so their model was you would make your own instrumentation. And at first they were using the commercial instrumentation, like, like a, a digital multimeter. Okay. Or an oscilloscope that could bring values in. And that, that's still hugely supported. That's a, that's a key piece of the industry. But then right around the time I started, they had began making what we call data acquisition cards. And so you would think of it now as like an audio capture card. Okay. To capture what, 192 kilohertz at 24-bit audio, that was unthinkable back then. Right. But that didn't exist even in the audio space. You might be bringing in something like 20 kilohertz. So to my entire tenure, there was one plot we would show every single year at our company meeting, which is this graph of number of bits, the accuracy of the bits, and how many of those we can bring in per second. And it wasn't just what we were doing, it's what the industry was. It's kind of that element of like the telescope and the microscope allowed people to see things they couldn't see before. Mm -hmm. And that changed the entire description, you know, the entire nature of the problem. Automated tests and data acquisition, when you start sampling things, it's like, I could take a DMM, I could write numbers down. I can't write numbers down 10 million times a second. Right. So automated test was all about acquiring information. And if you're doing a test on a helicopter blade and you're doing a destructive test, mm -hmm. so you're going to spin this thing until it shatters. 
it costs a lot to do that. Danger, you have to do it all right. Right. So you want to capture as much as you can about that. So the first time the right way. First time the right and way. And all the data that you can. Absolutely as much yeah. as you can possibly capture. And so Natural Instruments pos positioned itself to provide all the pieces in an integrated solution. So they had the acquisition hardware and then LabVIEW, the software that I was hired to help develop with an awesome team, was the software that made the programming accessible to the test engineers. And if you brought a programmer onto your team, more likely he was just a programmer. He didn't come with like the double E background or the mechanical engineering background. So he was just doing the programming. LabVIEW was a, a programming language that just made it fairly straightforward for engineers of multiple domains or other scientists like biologists to pull together their experiment in a, it's kind of the way people might think of putting together a web page using JavaScript and that you don't have to think about all the complexities. But for okay. most of them, it's even easier than that. So what was your motivation for joining it? I so I programmed the Mac. They did it fit what I was looking for doing. Is that niche? Yeah, that was the data flow programming, which basically data flow programming was opening the door to parallel programming because you could program with threads. I mean, back then, okay, C++ didn't exist. Java didn't exist. C was the most powerful language you could be using because you were kind of like, you were flying about a foot above the hardware. And you can then you could dip down if you needed to. But threads were the only way to do it. And it was complex and, and no libraries you were working with were really multi-threaded focused. And those were the big computers that had that. Okay. It, it would be more than well more than 10 years before it wouldn't be till Windows NT okay. that a desktop computer had full multi-threaded capability, like Unix did. And we were selling to machines that people were buying under and putting on their desktops for a lot less than a Unix workstation oh, yeah. would be. And then the Mac, the Mac wasn't multi-threaded until OS, OS 10 or OS X, if you called it that, Mac OS. So it was all, all those systems were completely cooperatively multitask. And so if you wrote a loop in your code and you're stuck in that loop, your, your machine hung. Yeah. And just, there was no, op I mean, there was an operating system in conceptual, but to anybody right. who came from the Unix world or something common like Vax VMS, they'd laugh at that and go, that's not an operating system. You're just going to loop and it's actually becomes infinite. Yeah, you'll see that a little bit in browsers that if you write a JavaScript, like an infinite loop in JavaScript and your machine doesn't go down, but sometimes that can lock up a web page mm -hmm. and then maybe Google or something, they'll say, oh, snap. Not, I got to turn that off. Yeah, I got to reload that page. Back then, if that happened, it was reach the back of your computer and turn it off, turn it back on and reboot it. So... Step one of troubleshooting. The motivation for joining is the, like the, it was the, the combination of the technology, the hardware and the software and the programming. Yeah. I had worked at ARL, started actually in high school. They had an internship program. And so I had an offer from ARL. Hands down, ARL was sort of the known, but it was a safe and secure known. Ooh, I knew the okay. people. It was kind of neat. And National Instruments was like, I have no idea what's going to happen here. See, it was private. Mention stock options and how that was going to work. I had no clue, but I, I like that. I, I, I like that option. I, I wanted to be in somewhere. It was a smaller team and, and it had more of a horizon. It had more of an, a blue sky to it. And I knew I was interested in that. And after joining in, it was just a small team mm -hmm. when we were in there. And then that, that certainly wasn't why I sought after it. I didn't know what software development teams looked like. And I just happened to come into one that was really nice. There weren't many jerks. Uh, well, that's, <laughs> I learned a lot about other ones that were a little bit more contract oriented jobs. And it's like, maybe the money was better, but it was, it was a grind. What kind of culture were they creating there with it, that kind of, that you saw that was kind of, Ooh, I like that. Well, National Instruments predominantly hired out of college. And they do it now a few years into it. It was more formally, they had an interview, they had interned, but when they started LabVIEW, they actually just made, opened up an office right off of Guadalupe. It had leaky ceiling. They always put more into the people than they do into the places they were at. But it was a family culture right from the back get-go. I walked in the room while I was doing an interview. There was one of the women who graduated the year before me, and she was working on the compiler. And she said, hey, Paul. And you just felt like... You you already, had a, already had a connection in there. Already had a connection there, right over there. Yeah, I mean, there was a few people I knew who graduated UT. And that was really small. We weren't recruiting from around the place. We had a lot of people from UT then. And yeah, we're instant friends. What, how'd you see that change over time? Did, did it change? I think it's hard to appreciate it for people who came on later on and on there. I right. mean, I'd walk on any floor. I wouldn't think anything about it. And I remember bringing someone up to our floors. Like, oh, I'm working on the third floor. So the cafeteria, I walk up the stairwell three floors and just to have someone of you. And they're kind of they're kind of like, am I allowed to be here? And it was like, sure. 
I know that feeling. I was really early on 23rd person where I could just walk into someone's office and just start talking or take yeah. them somewhere else. So could I be here? Well, and, and I can appreciate it. I have no idea what coaching they were given. Like you shouldn't just go, you know, wandering around maybe for IP or who knows what other different reasons. But that when you see that, you also begin to realize this, I've never been coached not to. Right, exactly. So I think it's my responsibility to be an ambassador of the culture. Mm -hmm. If it makes sense, if I'm giving you a tour, I'm giving you a tour, mm -hmm. you know, and I can do that. And, and I might pass on just some feel about what the company is that will be meaningful to that person. So yeah. you've seen that. But culture was always part of the team. I got to see our company meetings across most of almost 30 years. I, I think we did versions of it and even during COVID. I can't remember how. What was one of their key things when they founded the company was they wanted to make a place that was fun to work for. I mean, they stated that. And that they had to find a business model and a thing that fit. And because they were kind of in a spot where, you know, to use a business kind of concept, there was a little bit of a blue ocean. I mean, there were big people selling big solutions, big contracts. But if you were a biologist at a research lab at a university who wanted to do data acquisition on a Mac, there weren't many solutions that were out there. And so we had to buy my time on a mainframe. You had, to, you had to acquire data. You had to oh, have a machine. True. You couldn't get the data in. If you, had a, you could have a modem line. That's not going to help you at all. You need to get the data in. And if you were doing 3D graphs, the mainframe wasn't really going to help. It was all post-processing. Right. I frequently worked in the space of compiler technologies. And there's this efficient compilers compile. You have to compile ahead of time. So you're gonna, your code will be really optimal. And then the other end, there was interpreters. And then there's this thing that Java helped define, this thing called just-in-time compiling. Because Java was originally just interpreted, but it was slow. Mm -hmm. So they go, well, how are we going to improve that? Well, well, we'll compile it just in time. So when it's loaded up into the runtime, it'll begin to compile like hotspots. That's why there's a Java hotspot compiler. And JavaScript followed in suit in doing that. So JavaScript started off completely interpreted and they go, we can compile it. The odd thing is everyone would presume that compiling still took a long, long time, mm. which compilers got more complex and more inferencing to so some degree. But my counter to that argument was when I started at the company, a 3D rendered picture of a pool ball, three pool balls on a table, it would take two hours to get any kind of photorealism on it. Your video game is doing that 72 frames a second with a lot more mm -hmm. than three pool balls. If you apply that sort of Moore's law that's shown up in a lot of other domains and you apply that to your compiler technology, most of our compiler stuff should be doing, should be optimizing itself to the data set it has and doing it almost instantaneously. That's happening in the web browser quite a bit. But compiler architectures and mindsets change very, very slowly. But And we're seeing that being pushed by browsers and mobile devices because this is really the number one browser people use. Right. It's a small device. It's a low power. You can't just say, hey, I'll just I'll stick a bigger heat sink on that Intel processor. <laughs> can't, can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> can't do it. So that's the constraint of that model. And that's because it's like we need the best performance at the lowest power. I didn't even think about battery. compiling the data. Yeah. Well, AI is pushing that element into it because... In the classical computer science, you'd learn about, okay, here's this algorithm. Here's like, here's the shortest pass algorithm. Like, here's how you're going to sort, find the best way to route FedEx trucks around Austin every day. Mm -hmm. And when you would solve an algorithm and you'd learn, okay, this is this algorithm here is an order of complexity of n squared or n factorial, these giant numbers. But a lot of them are based upon what data set you have, what's the size of the data set. And so if you tried to come up with a algorithm that you can apply to generically any data set, Sometimes it fits well and sometimes it doesn't. And I think in the advent of AI, it's one of the things we're going to see, which is like, it's like spending a millisecond or two to go, why don't we solve the problem this way? We look at the data, we scan through it, and we think this is the nature of the problem. And that's kind of given toward a little bit more like how we might solve a problem. Except we, we'd solve that like the tough SAT question. The computer would, I think, is what we're seeing is it'll spend like five milliseconds deciding how it's going to solve the problem in the next 15 milliseconds after that. And so it's doing it at a magnitude faster. Do you have, recall any specific events or, or moments, experiences? Yeah, yeah, there's several. I think one of the things of the time, this is sort of Apollo era mindset. I mean, we're working with computers with like 128, 512K RAM. We had no debugging tools. So when you ran a program, for one, it, sometimes it might take 30 to 40 minutes to compile and link your program so you could run it. And then if it crashed and you wanted to go fix a line of code, it might take that same 30, 40 minutes again. And so you kind of did a mindset of like, how can I capture as absolutely much as information as possible when, when that happens? And this is one where it's like, you know, over a few weekends, I ended up writing a tool to allow us to like crawl through all the data structures 
that we had in there. So if some pointer got stomped on, remember, we're using C here. Mm -hmm. So memory corruption was easy, very easy to do. And we called it heat peak. And uh, it allowed you to just walk through all the object data structures using C in a structured way. And that was nice because I could actually see what's going on as long as the program was running. When it crashed, it was like, oh, okay, have you hit that rebut button. But then we realized, hey, I can write a small routine called last chance, which was like a 15 line main event loop program. Mm -hmm. There was this hit in the program and the, the disassembler on the Mac could actually find that. So we'd just say go last chance and it would run just that memory viewer. And so all of a sudden we could walk through it. So we couldn't stack crawl through our source code, but because there was no source. But you can see the event. But we can see the data structures that right. are there. And that just changed the way we were looking. It just made a tremendous improvement in our debug cycle. And then Rob sat just right across from me. We were all in, like, all in one room working on stuff. He added, you know, calling to printf statements so we could actually say, oh, okay, this object has this bounds. You know, this graphic object is these colors. This is the wire that it's connected to. These are the nodes that connect to. Wow. And so when something crashed, we were able to look through and find it. So, you know, that touch base, I think, you know, another question you asked related to thinking out of the box. And we had to think out of the box, everything. We had to solve all of our problems. But I, that was a really memorable one because it was like, I remember working on it on home. I could have worked on it there, but it was like I was so determined not to have to reboot my machine. You okay. know, I wanted to get more data out of that crash that I could get out of that. That was kind of a defining moment. What about with the relationships in there with working on stuff like that? So from the get go, I, I was I was working on some assembly language support for this GPIB bus, which is a, a fast parallel port, about one of the fastest ones around at the time. A bunch of people that I could tell were smart. And there was a real nice desk at the other end of the room. And I go like, yeah, I want that one sitting right next to the founder. Can I sit there? <laughs> and I think it was like four weeks later, they're going like, so which group is Paul going to go work on? And, and Jeff K goes like, well, he knows LabVIEW now. Why don't we want to just let him work here? And oh. Yeah, that was. And so, that, you know, when I think of things, tips to pass on is like, go where you can learn the most. Yeah, take risks. You can put yourself here in a spot to learn from other people. And founder's good too. But yeah, so I sat next to Jeff Godosky and Jeff Parker, Rob Dye, Steve Rogers. They were all part of that sort of core internal. I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Jeff Kodosky okay, was, yeah. was starting something and, and you were like a small group of... Friends. Yeah, let me tell you about another startup okay. we did in there. I worked in LabVIEW several times. I was always connected with that group. But the biggest competitor was someone trying to solve the problem themselves. It would be like a research scientist. Mm -hmm. like, right now it'd be like, Gee, I could buy your software that gives like precision data acquisition. You know, what is it I'm looking for? Maybe 24 bits, high precision, nice clean signals. I could buy your car to do this. That still doesn't cost that much, right? And you can buy the software and you can do the graphics. And then they'll go like, oh, I could buy an Arduino. Mm. And it's like, well, yeah, but what's the noise isolation on your analog input circuits? Sometimes that's cool. But literally for that scientist... The time he's putting into it and then hiring maybe the intern who's doing right. something and it's not working out for him and he has to end up supporting it after the student leaves. He ends up putting a lot more time into it. So it was a bit of a joke, but it was a bit serious. And the biggest competitor was someone who's trying to sort of ad hoc put their system together with the lower parts that aren't as well integrated. So to this end, LabVIEW is by that point our flagship product. People understood it. It was really working well. But our competitors who just made hardware, they would leverage other software and say, hey, you can just take our hardware. Here's a library we gave you, uh, and Visual Basic would be an mm -hmm. example. So Visual Basic was really becoming popular. It was a very easy to program. And our competitors would say, just use Visual Basic with our library. And so we made a real gutsy move to create a group. And Keith Winkler started that group. And we were called Component Works. And we decided to make the best Visual Basic program we could. And so we had our libraries to support our hardware and support it first class. And we did that, won a bunch of awards. And so our sales force would be like, as soon as someone go like, oh, I'm thinking about using Visual Basic, so and then I'll, I'll use this other hardware. And we'd be like, oh, sure, yeah. we'll sell you this. And it worked well. You know, I worked with engineers at Texas Instruments, had their compile tools, and they had all these graphs that would show how stuff was running. And I'm looking at the code because I recognize it. And I, go, and I actually met with them. They had a conference down and they came down. And they go, oh, yeah, we're using your tools. You had a, you had a solution for everything. Yeah, so yeah. in this case... So LabVIEW was kind of designed first and foremost to work with our hardware and had a tremendous set of instrumentation visualization. So you got your graphs, knobs, slides, things that the engineers were used to using. And then we came up with a product that worked with Visual Basic and supported our hardware. So some customers turned around and bought other hardware and then they use our visualization parts. But, but once, now you have to get them to work. 
Well, they work. I mean, okay. data is data, but when it worked with our hardware, it worked even better. Yeah. So, I mean, again, if you're determined to go the other route, there's different solutions. As the computers got faster, it, it wasn't so hard to bring in data. So what kind of t- team dynamics do you have in that in that little startup within the startup you were doing? We found a, a floor of the building that didn't have a whole lot of people and put first two of us and another person, another guy came in from Rice and we started up them there and pretended there wasn't any clock on a wall and just work. Oh, re- okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean our, the hours weren't crazy in on there, but I think we we're always driven by the people we were able to serve. I mean, when you see what people do with your stuff, mm-hmm. and I, I'm sure that shows up in a lot of different spaces. But when you see engineers and the kind of projects they're working, like if you visit NASA and say, okay, here's this test cell where we test space shuttle cells and, and you know, like, here's where we like fire plasma. And here's this, you know, sometimes lightning bolts fly all over the room and we have to hit the stick to stop the experiment. You just, it's just need to know you're helping, you're helping advance that front. How did the collaboration and teamwork shape your experience within that? One of the team dynamics is I think anyone, we do whatever it kind of took, whatever little piece. I mean, sometimes you're working at a, a part of the, of the visualization, just like how does a knob rotate or something like that. But your culture, the culture was always good. I mean, there was a, there's always a family feel. Mm-hmm. I mean, we work, you know, we frequently worked in the evenings and you always cared about one another. There was parties. We'd have things like that, but you know, it's like being there for someone's wedding, being there for special times, even, even in losses. So, so y'all are friends outside of work as well? Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. Once you know someone 20 years, of course okay. I'm talking later on, but in the early days we'd have potlucks. I think once a quarter, everybody bring foods in and our office furniture was like with the lattice thing that the uh, used truck, the used furniture truck would drop by. In the early days it would drop by once a week and our CEO would go out and pick out anything. If we need so something. the used furniture truck would stop by. Yeah. Okay. That's we had new monitors and used furniture. Used they fr- thought it was. I mean, that would be part of the culture. It was like invest in the tools and not in the in the workspace. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned something too when we talked a couple weeks ago about the growth rate. Oh yeah. yeah. That's that was clearly message when we had our quarterly or annual meetings, and that element is the company was designed to grow at a certain rate, a little over 23 percent, twenty three point something. Well, but the reason was why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The number isn't so much there, but it was designed to grow at a certain rate so that we, there'd always be opportunity for growth inside the company. And if you grow too fast, you had to pull in people from the outside that weren't familiar with your culture. It's going to be a like culture shock. Mm-hmm. And if you grow too slowly, then people will leave to go find better opportunities. And, and to that end, that's why they went public in 95 was so that they could actually share the equity with the company. I mean, it was specifically done for that. So the element was they always wanted to create opportunity for people. And we were in that engineering, this automated test market. It was a rapidly changing market. Mm -hmm. And there were limited companies providing innovative solutions into that market. So it was one that naturally lent itself to what territory do you want to grow into? I mean, there's a few competitors in there, but not a lot. And and so I say someone wants to be, you know, okay, let's, let's make another VP, you know, and that was the model that continued to the time I retired when we were creating major stripes. So this is automotive. This is semiconductor. These are other pieces. And some of them needed the same types of acquisition, but you needed a market force that understood the okay. entire description of that problem. It wasn't just, I need this sample rate at this many bits. So what is the visualizations you need with this? What is the way of storing data? What are the meaningful acronyms to that industry? You need someone who can talk that language. How did that affect your career? Did you change between those stripes? Yeah, I, I did. If it came into, okay, we're getting more heavily into digital test. Mm-hmm. I came in and did another stint and more extensions to the graph visualizations for digital logic, you know, hexadecimal encodings and things like that. And back to that question, those internal startups. One of the major stripes was National Instruments actually had an uh, interesting opportunities that, that popped up. Lego got into robotics but the RCX is famously the yellow brick. And they did some work with MIT and Tufts University to pull that out too. And really unbeknownst to us, they actually, the professor at Tufts University was using LabU to do the solution. And so they came down and visited us kind of on a cold call and go like, you know that package you sell for thousands of dollars? We'd like to license it for like 25 cents a copy. And more or less, we said, sure. And that project went for a few years. And then it naturally went its lifetime because the yellow brick, it was... It's still used in school, but there wasn't a ton of more being invested in it. And the engineer had worked on it and moved on to other stuff. But I love Legos. And so I was diving into it. And then I ended up supporting Dr. Rogers 
at Tufts. And he ended up coordinating a phone call to us with Lego. And I remember calling them and getting introduced because they really don't know who we are other than some software vendor that they happen to use. And I go, it's time you should make another Lego brick. And I think you should do it with us. And they kind of go like, who are you? What? What? <laughs> and I go like, you know, always be willing to go up the bat and take a swing at it. And he said, if you had a, a more powerful processor, you could actually control the motors more precisely. Mm -hmm. So you could actually make both wheels move at the same speed. Mm -hmm. So your car doesn't like slowly drift to the left, which it would. Little did I know that I actually stepped on one of the things that teachers fussed about the most. And that phone call kind of got us an invitation to, to go to Billund about two months later. I went there and uh, did a presentation to them. And I got, got the latest like little palm. These are you know, way before ancient mm -hmm. devices on there. So I had talking to a brick and controlling some stuff and plotting a graph. And it, you're, you're demonstrating what, how students might learn something. And you were mentioning some software related to the physics tool for the phone. Mm -hmm. So this is before, way before the phones. But it's that element of, you know, if you can, uh, if you draw a graph like square wave and say, if this is the car's speed, what, is that, what would that feel like? And it'd be like, going, stop, going, stop, mm -hmm. going, stop. But what if it was smooth? And so it's, what if you could draw this, what if you draw a curve that described how your robot was going to go? And so we just made up a few, this is the way education could roll out if you had more of a, an analytical library as opposed to this really primitive motion control and did that presentation. And like during the middle of that presentation, like all the guys, all the Lego team that gets off and goes talking in the corner and they go, and just standing there for a moment and they go, no, this is okay. Don't worry. <laughs> we sit down. And we came back from that. It was a good time. The Lego really does it, you know, they really invite you. It's another beautiful culture to work with. And then it was a few weeks later. They basically said, like, yep, we visited Microsoft and we visited Apple and we visited you. I don't think Google was on the radar then at that time. And it was like, basically, they decided we were the right size company to work with. So we worked with that. And so that was, that was, that ended up being in different forms for about 10 years. So you basically pitched the idea to Lego to come work with and I and won that partnership. I kind of kicked that off. Yeah. And then, then there's a whole team of people I right. worked with of others course. from our executive right. suite. They were obviously into it. Right. But we you put a scope on it. Right. You took the idea of trying to get to work with Lego and then you said, hey, do it this way. And this would be the process that you want to do. You'll help with education, which yeah. Lego's big on, especially with the programmer controller. Well, National Instruments has always had some like footprint in education because and so they do a major support, several universities, including down. I think they have a measurement lab. that's sort of the National Instruments Measure Lab down at UT. And because that's where the engineers train. So mm. that's where they learn. This is in where engineers are going to go, go out into the industry. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to want to make test systems. I think we'd all love to see them learning as a programming language. So for those of us who worked in the core of it, we always saw Labby as a programming language. But for most of the audience, it was really doing tests, being able to knock out quick tests or sophisticated, elaborate ones. And that was an intentional detour to take education, not just the education of like what you would see in college. It may be in some high school classes, but it's like, no, we can literally do the K-12. In fact, I was wearing that t-shirt the other day. And Lego knows how to do plastics. They were less focused on doing software. And so that became a perfect a natural partnership for us. So we worked on making the app software because we could deliver to Mac and Windows and ultimately mobile devices. So we knew those sides well. That worked well for several years. And once... Our leadership made sense. That's when we, they came over. And I remember giving them the tour of the building. And the, it really emphasized that point that, again, they knew us through the window of this software called LabVIEW. They corporately really didn't know a lot of what it was we did. And so I, I gave them a tour. I walked through you know, every floor of the building. It's like, okay, this is where people buy a like, quarter of a million dollar data acquisition systems. And here's the engineers that make that stuff work. So here's the stuff where we do our graphics. Here's where we do our documentation. So they could see all the stack that we do, you know, to make software that was quality and, and the kind of engineers we worked with. And they realized they could see that we took our engineering field, you know, at least as seriously as they take manufacturing fantastic kits. What they do to bring quality is just, it shows throughout their entire organization. And so that was kind of the, us understanding each other. And we went over there for another visit. And so we're playing soccer and, and the, the team colors are for the Danish soccer team. They love soccer. There's our red and white. So they had two sets of the jerseys. And so we were in one and the others. And we played a hard soccer game. Coming off says who won? And someone on our team said the red team won. And they, they always look back and, and I mean, they literally say like, that's when we knew you're the right guys. Because okay. there, there was only one red team is basically, it wasn't us or them won. It was like the red team won. And that's kind of that, that NI culture. 
Okay. It's like when you're partnering with someone inside the company or you're partnering with someone outside the company, you're really all on the same team. You try to get rid of that wherever you can. That is interesting to me is like they don't hire very often either. I don't know any stats. Outside looking in, it seems like the people that have worked there for a long time, I have another friend that works there in the R&D department <laughs> and he's been there well, at least 15, 15 yeah. years. Well, the main, their main model was we, we kind of like the three month interview. So we hire a lot of interns from colleges and okay. you, usually at the completion of their sophomore year. So they got two years behind them. They know that they're in the major they like and they're able to differentiate themselves. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of on-campus interviews and the sophomore year. And then usually if they, is, we invite them to their junior year, then we try to send them back with a job offer if they think the fit's good so that they don't spend time interviewing. And, you know, and at that point, if you know, you've, at that point, you've gotten like almost six months of interviewing with, you know, you, two parties have had six months exploring each other. Mm -hmm. Culture is a key piece. And when we had our company meetings, there was always a degree of fun and, and a degree of here's some of the core numbers we want to communicate. When the economy was soft, we all knew it was soft. Sometimes the raises were minimal. Sometimes there were none, but it was generally across the board. So who are your mentors? Because I'm pretty sure you had one. Or two. Yeah, when I came in, I started, there was a chance to take a desk in, in amongst mm -hmm. the, the core lab yeah, team, and I just sat right in there. So my mentors right off the bat were the founder of the company, Jeff Kodosky, and then Rob Dye and Steve Rogers were, were the ones I sat in the closest to. And the person that you need to ask a question to is like five feet away on each side and maybe a bit more. But what did they help you learn? What did they open up and show you? Well, the first thing you learn is just that element of nothing gets you down. You do what you can. I mean, you're trying to solve these problems, your computers, if it's crashing when something's not working. So debugging strategies. How do you get the most out of when your program fails? It crashes the term we would certainly use then. I guess that still works. How are you going to get the most out of that? Yeah, debugging strategies. Certainly going to have picked up. Who were the mentors that affected you? And then when you were a mentee and, yeah. then, and when you carried on later as, as a mentor? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the, the mentoring I got was was certainly like, how do we use the tools we use? Mm -hmm. We're working with a, a platform that was like at the time, like just extremely small programming on these relatively small Macs. And then when we got into Windows, Windows was it was not a it was not a pleasant era to work in software development. But by that time, I was actually doing as much of the mentoring to, to new people who were coming in and I was showing them how to work with because you'd come in and say, this is an impossible task. I mean, you're trying to solve something and the machine's crashing and and you're having to reinstall operating systems and, and you know, it could be almost demoralizing. But it's like, well, we do what we can. And then it's like, okay, something crashed. What can we tell from what happened? You know, how do we look at what, what data do we have? Okay, what's the stack look like? Let's look at the variables. What kind of data structures are most likely to cause problems? And so that, that idea of analyzing what went wrong, mm -hmm. that was kind of the, probably one of the top skills. And that's what you would like when we'd interview for. I'm going to do a switch on you here. When we interview, you could give an algorithm, a student, a question, and then like walk through something on a, on a whiteboard. And the number of times when you'd say, and if something went wrong here, what would you do? And they'd sometimes just freeze. Hmm. And, and they could learn it, but sometimes you ran into someone who you knew actually had encountered tough problems on what they were, on, on assignments they'd made in class where things didn't work right. Do you ever see anyone get into the mode of frustration when that question was asked? to be like almost meltdown or and then the opposite to someone just answer, I, I don't know. And say, let me come back to you and look it up or what kind of some of the responses you got on that. I think it, it's that element of you. You can always tell when you're talking with someone who's really used the tools to solve problems that they came up with themselves, like an industry piece, mm -hmm. or they had just done assignments where they found the answer they needed to find. And that's more of a reflection on the kind of the educational environment than they were in than this person themselves. But it did kind of give a measure on how prepared they were to take on a very chaotic world. Well, there wasn't drastic change within the work life or the work culture at NI over time. It was pretty much you had the same type of team builders, team yeah. dynamics. You had the same type of family atmosphere pretty much the entire time. How'd you make sure that that person you were interviewing wasn't going to come in and taint oh. that culture? Well, I think the culture... All the different people that were part of teams, I mean, almost every background I could imagine. The most core element was, are you willing to kind of, when I say give it your all, are you really ready to you know, take on that problem and go like, I'm going to try to figure out how I can, you know, within, within reasonable amounts of time. But I'm never going to just throw my hands up. I'm willing, and it's like, if I get stumped, I'm going to go over, 
we had a term called lamppost. One of them was the lamppost, which is I could go, hey, Steve, would you just look over my shoulder while I do this? And I'll sit here and I'll explain what I'm doing. And the person over my shoulder won't say a thing. And, you know, 45 seconds into I'm doing this, and I go, oh, wait, I figured it out now. Because you just, your minds were like needed to know that it had someone looking over your shoulder. And that you, so that helps you actually walk through and talk what you're doing. And then, and then you solve your own problem. But you had to be willing to go ask that person to do that. You had to be kind of humble to the point of well, like, I have, no, I have no clue what's going on here. I wish I did. And, and so we all sort of understood what it meant to be a lamppost to someone. You had to kind of be willing to, to not try to solve it all yourself. I mean, if you could, that's fine. But that's also was a time when you were sharing some of like how your software worked, how the code you worked. So when you were gone the next week and something didn't go wrong, the guy who was a lamppost goes like, yeah, I remember how that code works now. And hmm. so that lamppost was like a piece of that culture. And, and so as long as you could do that, if you were kind of like, I just want to work in my own cube and didn't want to talk with anybody, then that wouldn't really, that wouldn't fit. You've got to be able to share what you know and be vulnerable on like, this just isn't doing the way I thought it would be. Because if you just checked something in and you got like, I think it works. Was there ego ever involved in that with other people you saw while you're there that not too often? And, and I think there's the ones, you know, I can think of a few scenarios, but those are usually ones where after a few months, someone's going like, hey, I got a new job. Okay. You know, and it was, it was more like they found somewhere, they'd, they'd actually usually take, sometimes take the initiative to go find somewhere that had maybe a little bit less of a chaotic problem that was being solved. And, you know, so that, yeah, that was just part of the, that was part of it. You were telling me about the, sh the story about you all flew down to Peru because this was a, a nonprofit startup that you were working with. Yeah. Yeah. So after retiring from NI, I ended up working with the students from Westlake and they had this wonderful name and idea called Trash Bots. And that kind of fit well with this idea of I wanted to bring robotics that was just like super simple for a teacher to use in a classroom. And the tools we'd worked with, Legos and others, did really well with that, but that wasn't their super main focus. And so we, we had a few criteria of like, okay, it's just got to work. It doesn't have to have a computer. Almost everything else had to have a computer. And then ultimately we came up with a design that we did a lot of 3D prints of this. And then we ended up getting, we did a, an Indiegogo, raised the money for doing the molds and Shenzhen. And so we came up with this product. They're actually running with that business now. And I think they've sold well over a thousand. They, they've done some mass manufacturing and they, our focus has been the school districts. Mm -hmm. So not so much hobbyist. In fact, that was kind of an early design is like, a lot of the tools we work with are kind of things made for hobbyists. You can hear a little circuit board. It's like, we wanted something that needs to sit on a shelf, look nice. And when you grab it, you better pick it out of the box and be ready to run. It better just run right off the bat. And so in this case here, I powered it up and I can kick it into just immediate play mode where a kid can just make a robot's going to crawl around. And then you can turn around and program it through Bluetooth from your phone. And then we went to Peru, we got connected ultimately to the Ministry of Education through a connection and through that, the, the president of Peru. And so, yeah, we were soldering the wires the night before trying to get stuff down. And we had our first version of, the, of this trash bots. And yeah, I have some here. Maybe you'll have a picture in your podcast. And we got there. The, the trip went really well. You know, there's a few stories. But one of the examples of that, we're working with second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. And there's one girl is in this class and you can tell she's not really communicating well, but she's using the tablet computer and she's making it spell her name and flowers and she's run the program and the Bluetooth's all working well. And, and that week that, well, more than just that week, the teachers were on strike. There was quite a few strikes going on in Peru there. And we were in a very rural country, so they were able to kind of get by with breaking the lines, so to speak, because mm -hmm. they weren't really supposed to be there, but we were there. So they showed up and the week the teachers were crying. In that case, the, the girl I was talking with, she's deaf and she's there because she's supposed to be there, but doesn't engage in a lot of the class. And, and she picked up what we were doing right off the bat and oh, wow. they were able to, to see how that worked. And that was kind of an interesting story because this touched back to some of my journey through the Lego is if you Googled online, like one laptop per child, which is a major initiative that kind of preceded the lightweight laptops that kind of filled the vision that they were trying to do. We use laptops and Chromebooks are pretty low cost now. If you Google that, you'll see some of the major venues. Oh, there's lots of these one laptop per child sent down to Peru. And the principal goes and shows me the library, says, you're in that corner. There's all the boxes that have never been opened because we didn't know how to use them. Hmm. We didn't have the training for them. It was a real insight to a lot of great visions. It's, it takes a lot to get an idea out to the deployed into a way that's directly usable and appreciated and the teachers will use. Because if they pick up a piece of technology and it doesn't work once, 
and they got a class of 20 kids, they don't pick it up a second time. Hmm. It has to work every time. If it's some part of the launch cycle, it better work every single time. If it's something used for testing airplanes, every experiment you do has a high cost with it. It's got to run. So the software you write has to be very resilient, has to kind of a, a constantly like evaluating what's going on to make sure it's, it's double checking everything that's going on. It's interesting. It must maintain a high reliability to make sure accuracy of collection of data is pretty high stress and pretty intense in my mind because I've collected a lot of data, a lot using a lot of uh, data acquisition, manipulation of data, and to see what's going on with different things. Mm -hmm. And that has always come and created a high stress environment usually because you're short period of time, a whole lot of data, and you have to get through and turn that whole lot of data into a whole lot of information. It's interesting that the culture there was so family oriented in a high stress, relatively high stress world where a high cost, high expense, but maintaining that family culture is really intriguing to me on how they, they did that. They just did that from prioritizing it. Yeah, well, that, that lamppost is an element. Later on, we would do even more reviews. Mm -hmm. We call it buddying. So when you were checking in things to the main trunk, that's when you'd have a buddy. But that better not be the first time you have shown buddy your code. That's where you start by doing lampposts in on there. I remember setting up some of the first automated tests back in Windows. Every video card would have different bugs with. It was mm -hmm. crazy times in there. But yeah, the family element was like everybody knew a little bit about what everybody else was doing. And so that probably has some degree of redundancy. Mm -hmm. And that might have, that might come out in some, might be perceived in some elements of an inefficiency. To silo it meant that you're almost more exposed to not being aware of what's going on. Even probably within the different departments, we used to call them stripes earlier. The automotive, the semiconductor, the... Yeah, now those are a little bit more marketing-oriented mm -hmm. side. Yeah. So the R&D kind of helps supply those, okay. those different stripes. So we'd have one, you know, one kind of mindset on quality control that would feed all of them. But overall, I mean, yeah. 28, 30 years. Yeah, a lot change. Yeah, a 1.4 megabyte floppy to gigabit Ethernet. Right. That's incredible. And so it's exciting to be part of it. And, and now I'm, I'm working on just with education with kids. So over the, that long career and lessons learned and the, your career path, mm -hmm. what are some big takeaways, big picture takeaways for you? I think a few of them have kind of bubbled up. I like Jordan Rayner. He has a book called Master of One. And he brings out a few different key points. One of them is go where you can know that learn the most. That was something became, I kind of held close throughout. Look for opportunities and, and put yourself in a spot where you're, you're willing to take those risks. You know, so have enough margin where you can do those things. Fail fast. That was one of the ones that we've learned. So when we were exploring how to go to like, how am I going to go to Windows or this? It's do lots of experiments, do little tests to see how fast you can draw like, you know, a graph. How fast? What is the bottleneck? Because you could spend a lot of time architecting, a lot of time making system and then realizing the platform you want to go to isn't even viable. Then hmm. stay focused. In the case of the National Instruments, they had their focus of we're here to bring tools that make science and engineering more efficient, particularly for that test side, for doing research for any of those things. So to maintain your focus and on there. I came out, I, I basically did probably about five different internal startups, some of the more obvious, like the Lego one and the one we did with Visual Basic. And I think that's part of it, like putting, your, putting yourself in that bootstrap mode. Take what you take all that you know, and then look for somewhere that will benefit from that. And then you'll learn from that space too. So about every five years, I end up finding myself not exactly by plan, but you mentor other people, other people are ready to run with it on their own. And then you say like, okay, go for it, run with it. I'm going to go hop. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's time for the next chapter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. I, and you, you keep friends through all of those things. One thing we didn't talk about. And we, we've kind of touched on it. What, is, what are some of the, the achievements or milestones you're most proud of from that career? There are a lot of them. When I think about that, I think first and foremost is just the, the friends made. Hmm. You know, some of them are just personal, professional. You know, the days when we swap business cards, I go like, wow, I got a lot of business cards from people all around the world and different things. But to see, to know that you help them accomplish their, their own sphere, I think that's just a really, that's made their day that day. <laughs> Yeah, like you get a phone call from someone in like Australia trying to connect a Lego brick on Bluetooth and something's not working for them. You spend <laughs> half an hour and it's like at the end of it, they, you walk through all these Windows dialog boxes and then they go, like, okay, it's working now. And you go like, awesome. Yeah, so being part of that engineering world is, is just amazing. It's really take a lot of joy in seeing specifically like the Lego project. 
I've worked with so many people over the years, interviewed a few, hired a few, which would go, oh yeah, I used the Lego Mindstorms when I was in whatever grade. And I go, then you go, like, okay, that was a good return. Mm-hmm. You know, for all of us that, that worked on that, it's neat to see the impact. And that's again, go where you can learn the most and, and partner with people who have grand visions as well. Yeah. This has been great, Paul. I really appreciate it. I wish you the best on, all, there's so many great stories in the Austin area. Yeah. I mean, this is, yeah, examining, I'm really fascinated by this focus you picked for this podcast because to be a, a, the founder is an entirely another tier of, of things you think about and care about. And part of it is creating that culture, but you're on the side of, of having to care about it. Mm-hmm. And, and in my case, I'm going to, I got to inherit, I got to enjoy it. I right. got to see it and I got to see its effectiveness. And then, and turn around, like in the startups I've done and the things I try to carry that culture and bring it in. But I learned it. I learned it in my case. I learned it from them for their business. Yeah, exactly. CEOs and founders have to think differently and they have to motivate people, create that vision that people have to come around and and Mm -hmm. coalesce, Mm -hmm. but they can't do it by themselves. And so the people, the employees, the managers that maintain that culture or work within that culture are the ones that make those vision dreams happen. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for listening to another episode of Startup Anthology, the podcast. We will start a topical series soon, so please comment on what topics you would like to hear about or tell us about your story in the startup world. Please remember to subscribe, like, and share the show. Join me next time for an episode in which we'll talk to more people who have worked as startups and learn about their unique journeys.